Good evening and welcome to Rahel Baptist Church for Wednesday evening, March 17th, 2021. This evening's message brought to us by Pastor Michael Franklin is entitled, The Sovereignty of God. Enjoy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day and uh, God, I do thank you for just your protection, Lord, even in the weather, Lord. And I pray for those east of us. It sure seems like they're going to be in harm's way. Uh, God, I pray it not be too bad. And uh, God, just uh, thank you for just the sunshine and, uh, Lord, the rain that you provide. And God, thank you for the word. Lord, the word is uh, everything to us. And God, as we look at it tonight, God, I pray that you just speak to us. And or just if it's just one thought as we go through here that maybe we haven't thought of, or maybe something that we can use uh, in witnessing to somebody else. Lord, uh, we'll just be careful to give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we are going to talk tonight about the sovereignty of God, uh, the sovereignty of God. Let me go ahead and give you the outline as we get started. Number one, God's sovereignty over creation. God's sovereignty over creation. The second one is God's sovereignty over animals, over animals. And number three is God's sovereignty over nature, over nature. And the fourth one is God's sovereignty over salvation. So we see God's sovereignty over creation, over animals, over nature, and over salvation. Uh, Many people, and even some Christians, are not really clear on the sovereignty of God. Uh, There are two truths that cannot be separated found in God's Word. One is the sovereignty of God, and the other is the responsibility of man. Uh, To emphasize uh, the sovereignty of God without maintaining uh, the accountability of man leans leans towards fatalism uh, and kind of a case sera sera, whatever happens, happens. Uh, You have no say whatsoever in your life. But to emphasize only the responsibility of man is to lose sight of the sovereignty of God, which exalts man and dishonors God. The answer to the question is both. It takes both when it comes to election, predestination, and salvation. And we did uh, preach a sermon uh, several, uh, you know, a couple of months at least ago about that. Tonight we want to look deeper into understanding the sovereignty of God. I just jotted down a definition of of sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. Uh, The supremacy of God, his kingship, his lordship, and his absolute control over everything and everybody. I'll say it again. The supremacy of God, his kingship, capital K, his lordship, capital L, and absolute control over everything and everybody. And so let's dive into this. God's sovereignty over creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And depending on who you talk to, uh, there obviously are evolutionists. Uh, There's people that believe the Big Bang uh, theory. Uh, But you have to understand, to create something, all right, you have to exist. Let me put it this way. You know... uh, You have to exist to create something. And we believe uh, God is sovereign and and God has always been. It's always been God. And it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we can see here two things. We can see God and we can see the Holy Spirit in creation. But it's more than that. I want you to also see in 1 John. Go with me to St. John. John. John chapter 1. John 1. In the beginning, notice the very same start. The difference is Old Testament and New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And we know through the New Testament, uh, Jesus and God are the same, all right? So what this tells me was God always was, Jesus always was, 
Jesus was in creation, okay? And the Holy Spirit also was in creation. So we see, you know, the Trinity at the very beginning of the Word of God. And, and it was God, folks, that created. And, and a lot of people have trouble with how does he just speak something into existence? And the bottom line is, folks, it's faith. By faith, we believe Genesis 1. And not just Genesis 1, but the whole word of God. And it says, all things were made through him, verse 3, and without him nothing was made that was made. So we see God's sovereignty over creation. Now go to the last book in the Bible, Revelation. <coughs> Revelation 4. Verse 11, Revelation 4, 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. I find it interesting that in the first part, the first book of the Bible, he speaks about his sovereignty and about creation. And even in the last part, where they are in heaven, if you would just look back up there, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. Folks, he has already been. We know God. We, we, we saw and we, we've read Jesus, all right, while he was here. We read his life. And him and the Father were one together. So God's sovereignty over creation really begins everything. And if we miss that, then we're going to miss the other parts of his sovereignty. So, the sovereignty of creation. Number two, God's sovereignty over animals. Over animals. Look at, with me to Numbers. The book of Numbers. We're going to be all over the Bible tonight. And if you look at Numbers chapter 22, we know it's the story of Balak, uh, Balak who was the king of the Moabs, Moab, Moab, and uh, we're looking at Balaam. Uh, he was a soothsayer, all right? And uh, the king really got afraid of the Israelites because he had heard what they had done to Jericho. If you just, you know, go back and some of them, no, I'm, I'm getting this, no, that's not right. That's not true, all right? It, it, that's another one. I'll, I'll have that in just a minute. Sorry about that. But Balak was the son of Zippor and was the king of the Mo Moabites. And basically what Balak wanted to do is he wanted... Uh, uh, you know, Balaam to curse Israel, to curse Israel. So uh, it, God said in verse 12, you shall not go with them and you shall not curse, curse them for they are blessed. But what, what happened was uh, Balak basically was bribing this, this Sesur. And folks, you know, there's always temptation when there's uh, money there. And so he told him not to go with them but he did anyway, and uh, let's, let's look in verse uh, 28, 28. Matter of fact, three times if you look here, uh, you know, he, he was riding his donkey, and three times, uh, you know, he, he took his, his, his sword out, he took different things out, and what he did not understand, that there was an angel in the way guarding against uh, you know, what he was wanting to do. And, and Balaam, folks, was just basically doing the wrong thing. He was disobeying God. And so three times he struck. Now look in verse 28. Verse 28. Then the Lord opened the mouth. After the third time he had struck his donkey, he opened the mouth of a donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have you done that you have struck me these three times? Now folks, Donkeys don't talk, all right? I mean, that, that just doesn't happen, all right? So the, the deal over animals, folks, God can use everything. His power, his authority, uh, his supreme power rules over everything. I mean everything. In, in verse 29, and Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand. Now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. 
Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in hand. What did the donkey do, folks? The donkey was smarter than the man. All right? The man was going to go against what God told him to do, and even the donkey could see the angel of the Lord. And, and, and it says, And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck this donkey three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. And the donkey saw me, and he turned aside uh, from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have killed you by now. Let her live. So God rules over the animals. And another thing I, I was thinking about was about Noah and the ark. All right, Think about what God told him to do. Uh, turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 19. No, Genesis 6, 19. Genesis 6, verse 19. And God first told him to build the ark, and then he told them, all right, you need to take a pair, two, two by twos, and get those together and get them on the ark with you. And look at verse 19. And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, into the ark to keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female. Now, folks, think about this. Think about what would have to happen. This, you know, I was reading this and I was thinking about this. There is no way Noah could have got a male and female of every species, every kind of animal there are. Okay? There's just no physical way to do that. But yet, God, I mean, was orchestrating that because again you know you know he told man to be fruitful and multiply but that was going to happen after the ark hit dry land so what did God do he paired up every every one of those every one of those and they marched into the ark together two by two I don't know about you but that just that just blows me away you know just just little things like that understanding the power of God and the sovereignty of God in that. So we see God's sovereignty over creation. Uh, we see God's sovereignty over animals. And then we see God's sovereignty over nature. Turn with me to 1 Kings. And uh, I just I apologize. I, I got it all messed up when we first, first started there. Uh, God's sovereignty over nature. And we remembered what happened in 1 Kings uh, Elijah had the big battle, and he defeated 650 prophets of Baal. All right, and uh, you know Jezebel basically put a bounty out on him. Okay, and uh, folks, one thing you need to remember: always be aware after victories. See, we 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 you know sometimes when we we are defeated, we just we just say, oh man, that that's a bad thing. But sometimes even victories can be a temptation, all right? Because sometimes after big victories, we let our guards down. And I think this is what Elijah was doing here. And Elijah was basically running from Jezebel, but God showed his power over nature. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11 of chapter 19, 1 Kings 19, 11. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and there was a great and a strong wind torn into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in a fire, and after the fire was a still, small voice." And folks, I've been asked many, many times, why does God allow things to happen? Why, why, did, why did God allow COVID to happen? Okay? Uh, again, folks, it has to do with his sovereignty. He knows better than we do. Now, I believe there's also 
a judgment. Okay, if you just go through the Bible, you know, in the children of Israel, they would do good for a while and then they'd mess up. Then he'd put them, you know, uh, he'd, he'd have them, you know, captured for 40 years or 70 years or for what, whatever number there is. And folks, I think it's both, folks. Because, you know, the things that get us a lot is, is death. Okay, why did, and when it talks about death, you know, God could have saved and you can fill in the blank there. And folks, I'm just telling you, God's sovereignty knows best. Even when we can't see His hand, all right, we have to trust God's heart. And He doesn't do things just to, you know, punish us. Even though we are, you know, if, if we sin as Christians, all right, we know uh, that we sometimes are disciplined and we do go to the woodshed. But in his sovereignty, the bottom line is he knows better than we do. Just like what's happening today. You know, all the last two days they said, it's going to be bad, it's going to be bad, it's going to be bad. All right, tornado's going to break out right there. It's going to start right on the Oklahoma-Arkansas border. All right, for some reason, God said, no, that's not what, what, what we're going to do. And so everyone to the east, and then you think, well, you know, what is what is Little Rock done? Or what is, and folks, that's what I'm saying. We don't know. You know, we, we are not God, and we can't lock God in a box, is what I'm trying to say. Everything he does is for a purpose and for a reason. All right, and, and we should not question his sovereignty, okay? I, I think of Job, all right? I mean, I don't know any man on earth that has went through, you know, what Job had went through. And I don't know a whole lot of people that probably would have reacted like Job did also. And we know what he said. You know, naked I came into the world, and naked I'm going out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we have to understand God's sovereignty is always in action, even though we don't see it. And it's in, it's in nature too. Uh, Joshua chapter 10. Joshua 10. Go back to Joshua 10 for me. And we know in Joshua 10, uh, you know, this, this was the one <laughs> that I got mixed up. Jericho and all that was going on. They defeated Jericho. And the thing you have to understand, folks, is Jericho was uh, wall fortified. I mean, if, if there was any town that probably couldn't be defeated, it would have been Jericho, all right? But still, God, you know, in, in what he does, it made no, uh, you know, military sense whatsoever, okay? You, you march around the city one time. You march around the city two times. You march around the city. And I, I just guarantee you there were people laughing at that and what was going on. They were just thinking, what are these what are they doing? But I'm telling you, on that seventh day, when the trumpets were blown, and folks, I'm telling you, uh, Steve, I don't care how many trumpets you have, you're, if you had a thousand trumpets here, it's not knocking a wall of a city down. It, it's just not going to happen. So God had already given them the victory and knocked it down and, and defeated probably in those days a fortified city that that they thought, man, there's no way they're going to do this. All right, so what happened? Hey, they went, you know, the, the people of uh, Gibeon went to them, and they thought, man, we, we ne need to make a pact with these folks. All right, if, that, if this can happen, then it can happen to anybody. And the five kings of the Amorites uh, got together and just said, man, we've, we've got to take care of this. We really do. And God, in the battle, in the battle, basically, uh, you know, fought for them. Matter of fact, uh, early on, you know, the, you know God delivered, uh, you know, at Beth Horon. Uh, he, it, the Bible literally says there were more people killed by stones than they were by Israelites. So God, again, was with them. And here's the deal about nature. Uh, look at verse 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord, in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites, 
before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and the moon in the valley of Adijon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for a whole day. And there has and there has been no day like that before or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought with Israel. Folks, think of that. God stopping time. Just totally stopping it for 24 hours. Can you imagine what would happen if that happened? Uh, you, know, you know, here, just... I mean, we, we go by our clocks, we go by time, we are, we are glued into that. And folks, I'm just telling you, that's how, I, you know, one of the things I'm trying to get us to understand tonight is how powerful God is. See, we look at our lives and we look at the world around us and we sometimes just get down because we think the world is winning. But folks, I got news for you. Any time God wants to, he can flex his muscles. Anytime. Anytime God wants to intervene for us, he can do that. That's what the sovereignty of God is. He is in control. He is supreme. His word is true. He is almighty, not just mighty. He is almighty. And he literally stopped time in, uh, in, in Gibeon in those days. So we see... God's sovereignty over creation, over the animals, over nature. And, and again, folks, I could have added, I mean, you just go through the word. I could have had many, many more, uh, you know, points and examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament to speak of all these things, all right? Uh, nature, you know, you think of, you know, when Peter and James and John were out in the water and they were fishing and, you know, they, you know, Jesus told them, hey, cast the net on the other side. Now, folks, I know one group or one Bible, you know, uh, said they had 156 fish, all right? And here's what a man told me one time. He said, you, you, know, what thing, you know what I think might have been happening? I'm thinking they went out there and they had, you know, bread and they had stuff in the boat and they were eating and, and they were just tossing part of their bread out. And what was this man trying to do? He's trying to logically explain a miracle of God, that it was the bread they were chunking out in there that, that the fish that attracted the fish. That's, I heard a guy say that that is a possibility. And you know, my answer to that was, that's not the way the Bible says it. OK? Think about this. Hadn't caught a fish all night. Jesus said, toss it out there. Folks, all he has to do, all God has to do is say, okay, all you fishy fishies, you just gather on this side of the boat and y'all just hang out together. All right, that's the kind of power that God has. So, folks, I know he cares for us. He knows our situations in life. There is no situation that is impossible for God. My Bible says all things are possible. All things are possible. So let's look lastly at God's sovereignty over salvation. Uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke 19. We're going to now dive into the New Testament. Luke chapter 19. Verse 10. And this is Jesus is speaking. Jesus. And you know the story of Zacchaeus, all right? I mean, he picked out Zacchaeus. He was on the road, uh, and he knew who Zacchaeus was. He knew, uh, you know, people say, you know, his short stature, and they all say something about that. But, folks, that, that means nothing. Uh, folks, Jesus comes into your heart. It doesn't matter how big or how short or how tall you are, okay? Jesus went that way for one purpose, and that was for salvation, but here's, here's what Jesus wants. Verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Folks, that was Jesus' purpose in life. 
And when you think about it, folks, he came to die. All right? I mean, when he was born, and I understand what some people say, well, we're all dying. And, and it's true. Okay, from the time you are born, you are walking down the road. And, you know, it's not fatalism that, you know, I'm always thinking about death. I'm always thinking about death. But you have to understand the group that he is talking about. Folks, he's talking about people that don't know Jesus. All right? And, and that's, that's what I'm saying in, in witnessing and in what we do. And here's the deal. Folks, we don't know who has been predestined. We don't know who has been chosen. We can't judge people. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us not to judge people. So even in our witnessing, we have to assume that people are lost until we talk to them and know otherwise. That's our responsibility. The lifeline of Jesus, the bloodline of Jesus was for the souls of men. It was for the souls of men. He came uh, for, for, you, for you and I. Uh, Luke chapter 19 no, excuse me, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is love which are in Christ Jesus. Uh, this, uh, this is a faithful saying and worth uh, all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners who, am, who I am the chief. All right, who's writing this? This is Paul, okay, he's writing to Timothy. Verse 16, however, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Think about this, those who are going to believe. What does that mean? They haven't believed yet, all right? And folks, what this is telling me, you know, some people think, well, I presented the gospel to this person and they didn't accept, so I just have to move on. I just have to move on to someone else, all right? The gospel, you know, sometimes it's, it's described as a seed. And if you think about a seed, you know, that seed has to be planted. That seed has to have good soil. That seed has to have water. That seed has to get the the weeds from around that. And just because somebody doesn't get saved the first time you present the gospel, that doesn't mean they're not going to get saved. And I think even, I, I think I, in my life, have been guilty of this. You know, if you, you hit them once, you hit them twice, and you hit them three times, and you're thinking, ah, you know, three strikes and they're out. All right, folks, we need to keep praying. We need to keep going. And, and again, not badgering not harassing, you know, not judging. But, but I, that phrase just really stuck out to me. Who are going to believe on him for everlasting life? Verse 17, now to the king eternal, immoral, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. A lot of people say on earth that Solomon was the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth. But folks, I got news for you. Our God, I'm just telling you, Solomon wouldn't hold a light to our God. He is so wise. He is so smart. He is, you know, he can see the past. He can see the present. He can see the future. He knows everything that's going on, you know, in our lives. And what we do sometimes... Folks, we're real bad about this. We hear the news or we, we hear somebody said something to me today. You know, did you read that thing about South or North Korea? Did you hear Jung King whatever saying, you better not mess with, what, with us. We're going to blow you off the map. Now, folks, if I just sat there and thought about that and, and dwelt on that and dwelt on that, I mean, I would lose sleep and I would worry. But the Bible tells us not to worry. Okay, it's clearly said in Matthew that we as Christians should not worry. I got news for you. The little, what did Trump call him, little rocket man? You know, I mean, again, I'm, I'm just being humorous. I'm just not, I'm just saying it's not a political thing. All right? God's not worried about little rocket man. 
All right? He's not worried about how many nuclear things he's... And we as Christians should not worry about it either. I believe in having military. I believe in having a strong military. But I got news for you. When God moves, I'm just telling you, he will control the situation. And it will turn out the way he wants it to. And then it, then let's look at uh, John chapter 6. Back to 6. And again, the sovereignty and salvation. John chapter 6. Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one, no one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Folks, I'm telling you that sovereignty of God is he knows. He knows who it is. He knows his children. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, they are going to be saved. They are, uh, the, you know, the Holy Spirit has to draw somebody you know, you don't wake up one day and just say, hey, you know what, I think I'm going to be saved today. It, that's just not how it happens, folks. Uh, it's the sovereignty of God, and the key here is the Holy Spirit. So we see his plan. Uh, we know, uh, folks, what, what his will is. We, we can know the will of God. And as long as we just keep trusting and keep putting our faith in Christ, and not worrying about things. It's, it's not this I don't care thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just saying, listen, you know, what happens? You know, uh, you know God is there. God is with me. God's going to help me handle it. God is for me. God is with me. God is in me. And his sovereignty is going to win out. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, God's will, God will do what's best for us, and he will do what's best for his kingdom. And is that not what we as Christians need to focus on? We need to be kingdom-focused. Okay, kingdom-focused, because he has a plan, and that, is, that plan is for people to be saved, for people to come to know Christ. And folks, we need to be always busy about our Father's business. And folks, I'm just quoting Jesus there. I'm just quoting Jesus. What are you doing? Why are you still working? Why are you still doing these things? Why are you still preaching? Why are you still doing this? And, and even in, as a 12-year-old kid, when he was lost there, and for three days they couldn't find him, and you know, Jesus' parents were just so upset, so, and we would be upset too, all right? But Jesus said, hey, listen, I just need to be about my Father's business. And folks, staying in God's will and understanding his sovereignty, his sovereignty over creation, creation, his sovereignty over animals, his sovereignty over nature. And again, I'm saying, you know, if you want to build a storm shelter, I'm not telling you not to build one. You know, I mean, I mean if the tornado warning went off, okay, we don't have a storm shelter. And if it got bad and, you know, it was heading our way, uh, we'd probably drive down to cook school and get in their shelter all right but i am telling you i kid you not my grandmother was terrified of storms and tornadoes and even it went over into my mom's life and even it you know we lived on 2721 i and we didn't have a storm shelter and i'm telling you every time not a warning even in watches if they even thought it we'd run to the storm shelter Folks, God's with us. God's for us. We, we just need to run to him and trust in his sovereignty. Father, thank you. Thank you for your sovereignty. Uh, God, I know a lot of times uh, we almost question why you do and why this is happening and, you know, what, what is going on? You know, what, what about this variance to the coronavirus? And what about people attacking us and what about and Lord I know you don't want us to uh, focus on the what ifs Lord uh, uh, I read a stat one time that said 72 percent of the things that we worry about never come true never come true so God I pray that we would focus on the right thing God focus on who you are uh, focus on what you're about and even in the sovereignty of God. 
Lord, uh, we know your heart. And, Lord, you want everybody to be saved. And I understand not everybody's going to be saved. But, God, you want them to be. And so, God, I pray that even in our conversations, uh, even with people who worry, that we could uh, testify, that we could share Scripture with them, and uh, that we could help them to understand how powerful you are and how almighty you are. So, God, I pray this would encourage us in the faith. And God, I just, I just thank you that nothing gets by you. You know everything that happens to every one of us. You know the number of hairs we have on our head. So God, you know us intimately. So God, again, I pray that we would just trust you, depend on you, and look to you for all things. God, we love you and we want to serve you. And God, I, I was just reading some other, the, the Revelation and some of the other ones. Chapter 5, I was reading again and just thinking how wonderful it's going to be to be up there with you and singing with literally millions or maybe even a billion people uh, in heaven, God. Thank you. Thank you for that promise. And God, thank you that you are preparing a place for us. And God, we're going to serve you faithfully. We're going to love you and we're going to point people to you until you say it's time. And God will forever be grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahil Baptist Church. And may God richly bless you.